Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar, which is brought to you by Southern and Tropical Beef Technology Services in conjunction with the Cooperative Research Centre for Beef Genetic Technologies, commonly known as the BCRC. My name is Philip Mann, and I am a Technical Officer with Tropical Beef Technology Services based in Rockhampton, Queensland. Your main presenter tonight will again be Andrew Byrne, who is a Technical Officer for Southern Beef Technology Services and based in Armadale, New South Wales. I'd like to extend a special welcome to Emily Piper, who is joining us online from Brisbane, to answer any questions you have regarding tonight's topic. Uh, Emily is the science leader for the Animal Genetics Lab at the University of Queensland's Gat Gatton campus. Tonight's webinar is titled Utilising DNA for Parent Verification and is the second webinar in the Know Your Genes webinar course, which aims to provide producers with a better understanding of DNA technology and how this can be applied in their herd. Over the next four weeks, at the same time every Monday night, we will be covering other topics, which include uh, DNA technology to manage genetic conditions, uh, changing type traits with DNA technology, and utilising this technology to improve production traits. We'll then be finishing the course with a presentation looking at a cost-benefit analysis on incorporating this technology into your herd. As has been the case for the first two webinars of the course, leading scientists from the BCRC and industry representatives will be assisting with the remainder of the presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Philip, and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, so, as Philip talked about, then uh, tonight's session will really focus on how we can use DNA technology to um, collect pedigree information for parentage verification. So, um, obviously, last week we covered quite a bit of theory about DNA technology. Tonight, we're going to start getting into how we can apply that. So, where we're going to head with this session is we're going to start off by just discussing. Uh, why we want pedigree information, maybe how accurate our current pedigrees are uh, based on how we're currently collecting it, and then start looking at well, what use can DNA parentage verification be, how does it work, what does it cost, and how can we apply that within our operation. So as Philip said, I really encourage you to ask questions and we'll stop periodically and try and cover those. So to start off, with, when we start talking about pedigree information, I guess the first question which comes to my mind is why are we collecting pedigree information? What, why is it important? And I, the, the first thing when I think about this, obviously the, I think a lot of you will answer this question first up. The reason why you're recording pedigree information is simply because it's required by your breed society to actually record those animals with them, to register those animals. So that's, I guess, as a seed stock producer, a number one requirement. But if we start to look into that in a bit more detail, we start to say, well, why is the Breed Society asking us for that pedigree information? What is the purpose of it? And that really applies to not just beef animals, but pedigree animals um, across different species and also across different countries. So I've put up my thoughts then as to how people are using pedigree. I'm sure there are other people in the audience um, who may have other uses for pedigree information. But the reason why I, or prim primary reason why I think people are after pedigree information is to assist them with their breeding decisions. So historically that has been, uh, when we're looking at, at animals, we can go through, have a look at the animals within the pedigree and try and um, assess, I guess, what the different genetics of those animals were and maybe use animals which had desirable uh, animals back within the pedigree. So um, that, that's the first point of view that we're using it to, as a kind of to um, inform us when making breeding decisions. That really then flows into the importance now of the pedigree information within our genetic evaluation programs. In the same way as in the past people looked at pedigree information, tried to make a judgment as to what the likely genetics of that animal may be carrying. That is now forming the basis within our genetic evaluation program. So it's for pedigree is, is feeding into the breed plan analysis and breed plan is then going off looking at the animal's performance but importantly going and using the pedigree to collect or collate a whole lot of information about the performance of the animal's relatives to come up and give us an idea of what the likely breeding value of those animals are. So that's, that's where pedigree is forming in. It also, from a breed plan point of view, pedigree information is quite critical now to our ability to run joint 
analyses um, across different herds, so that the genetic linkage that is provided by that pedigree, the linkings of the different herds, uh, allow us to run uh, across breed evaluations and now across country evaluations. So pedigree information in that form um, is critically important. Obviously, with pedigree information, we also have some other things we can use it for, particularly to try and manage inbreeding, um, and that forms into us trying to uh, not let genetic conditions start to form and things by um, inbreeding levels getting up. So, to me, they're the, the main reasons why we want pedigree information, and obviously the more accurate the pedigree information is, then the more useful it is for these particular purposes. How are people currently recording pedigree information? I think it's important to, to go through and just cover that before we start looking at the DNA technology and how we could potentially use that. So to me, um, again, and it's very hard to make generalisations about how people are recording pedigree information when we're trying to run this webinar Australia-wide, but to me there are two main components. The first one is people are collecting sire details really when they're doing the joinings for, for the dam. So, They'll go through, for each dam, everybody will have uh, collect the, the size that she's been exposed to as, as the first point of view. Uh, then when we get to actually the calf hitting the ground, then people will be starting to match up the dam with the calf, go back, have a look at the joining records, and then collate the sire to the various calves. How people are collecting that damming uh, information probably varies quite considerably. Um, a lot of people now, particularly in the south, will be tagging at birth and obviously collecting the, the information from the dam like at that stage. Others will be then going through, uh, if they're not tagging at birth, and mothering up calves from basically birth right through to marking and possibly after marking in some cases. So to me, that's uh, the general ways that people are collecting pedigree information. I'm sure there, there's other ways out there that people are doing it also. That then raises the question as to, well, based on that kind of process, how accurate is the pedigree information that we're currently collecting? And I'm not really sure whether we have a good assessment of that, um, but I, it's interesting to go through and start to think about, well, where are the current kind of areas where we could have errors creeping into the, situ into the, um, the collection of the information at the moment? So I've just listed some here that, that immediately spring to mind for me, um, starting off there with obviously errors or ch the challenges of mothering up if people aren't tagging at birth and they're going through trying to collate uh, calf versus the cow that's mothering them, that, that can be quite challenging a task. It also is we're just looking there at collecting information about well, which is the dam which is actually mothering the calf. There's no guarantee that that cow that is mothering the calf is actually the mother um, of that calf. And cross-mothering is an area um, which we know occurs. We're not quite sure how significant it is. Certainly in some breeds I think it will be greater than in others. Um, but we do know from some of the limited research which has been done that there is a degree of cross-mothering. Uh, obviously cross-mothering is probably more evident in some of our sheep breeds. I think they've done a bit more work on it where they've got big numbers of twins uh, and that kind of thing. They have shown some quite high levels of cross-mothering. Um, if we start looking at the AI process, so we go through, um, there are several different er areas within the AI process where errors can occur. First of all, the AI companies probably won't like me saying this, but you as a seed stock breeder have no guarantee really that the semen they provided you with is actually uh, the semen of the sire that, that you think it is. So I'd like to think that's an issue, but uh, potentially is an area of error, and you certainly have no way of knowing whether it's true or not. Um, when you're actually doing the AI process, using the wrong straw by accident, people writing down the wrong AI sire when they're doing so as part of their bookkeeping, and then obviously when the calves are on the ground, we'll have some calves by the AI sire, some by the backup bull which has gone in, and with um, an overlap in calving, it can be quite difficult trying to um, assign sire to the backup bull versus the AI sire in some cases. If we move to multiple sire uh, matings, obviously under our current situation, uh, we have no way of determining the individual sire. So we haven't actually got errors there, but we just have to assign a, a multiple sire to kind of group to that with the component size. We don't know the individuals. They're also around calving, I guess, for people that are tagging at birth are some other areas 
where potentially we can get errors coming into the system. Cows not necessarily mothering their calf, so people going out into the paddock to do their tagging and finding calves with no apparent mother um, is one area, and then trying to do some guesswork about who the mother of that calf is, particularly, I guess, some cases there with, with twins, where the cow may just be mothering one calf and have abandoned the other one. Um, also with some first calf heifers, that kind of thing can slip in. Also, another case might be cows that start mothering calves other than their own, and I've talked about cross-mothering, but in this case, I'll probably refer to situations where people may tag a calf, assign it to a cow, and they come out in the next day or a couple of days later and find that that cow has actually had a calf herself. So we know that some of the very maternal cows will actually go through and hunt the, hunt the real mother off and start mothering a calf as, as they come up to, as the hormones start coming in the lead up to calving. Um, so there are some other kind of little errors that can occur into our pedigree situation. Not big, not big situations, uh, but in a certain percentage of cases, these kind of errors can come into it. Then we start considering just some ongoing kind of uh, management situations. So the old bulls, jumping fences, uh, when things don't always go according to plan, um, we can get some errors sneaking into the situation. Then, of course, in all of that, we haven't talked about the human errors which can come in. So just the, the errors, taking the information and some transcription errors and things which can occur when we're transferring things from paddock books to computers to submitting it to breed societies. There is a degree of error which can come into the situation. So they're just, to me, um, a couple of areas where errors can come into it. Obviously, we hope that they're not big issues. But if we come back to that original question as to, well, how accurate are the pedigree information, or is the pedigree information which we're currently collecting? An interesting kind of insight into this was provided recently with the Limousin uh, progeny test program. So um, some of our breeds now are starting to embark on progeny test programs. In this case of Limousin, um, they had a 300 mixed cows across, a, a, I think, two different herds. Um, in that program, there were 10 sires uh, used by AI, and then three backup bulls put in over those to, to cover the 300 cows. Obviously, they went through and, and collected the pedigree information as per the, the standard process. But then because this was really a progeny test program, they wanted to go in and make sure that the, the sire information they collected was accurate. So there was DNA information collected on all those calves, and they were actually sire verified through the University of Queensland to check that, that parentage information which has been recorded. And what they actually found was that of the 227 calves that were on the ground, and we, we started with 300 cows, um, there were 12 which had incorrect sire information recorded, or 12 calves whose sire information didn't match up between the DNA and what had been noted down um, through the normal course of recording. So they went through and investigated where that error was. Um, in this case, they had two calves which had clearly swapped mothers, so um, there, there was some cross-mothering. Um, during the AI process, the, the AI sire had actually been incorrectly noted for three different calves. So whether that was a kind of a, an error recording the information, writing it down in the book, or whether they'd used the wrong straw accidentally, uh, they, they don't know. There were four calves which had been incorrectly assigned to the backup bull when they were actually by the AI sire. So there, were, there was a bit of error there. And there were some actual bookkeeping errors for a further three calves. So when information was being transferred from the, the paddock book through to actually being recorded with the breed society, it had been mucked up for three other sires. So the net effect of that was that there was about a 5%, or it was actually a 5% error in the sire information which had been recorded for those calves. Now, in my mind, the Limousin program really follow um, best practice type of guidelines for collecting pedigree information. So I would um, use that as a bit of an indication that that may be the level of pedigree error that we currently have that's been collected. I think that we, we'll get a lot of uh, variation. In some situations it might be higher, and in a lot of other situations it might be a lot lower. But we have really kind of limited data about how accurate the pedigree information really is. So that leads us into this, um, I guess, where the DNA information can assist us as a tool. We know we are collecting pedigree information at the moment, but it's not perfect. There are some errors in it. Um, so we do now have some tools to assist us collect more uh, accurate pedigree information.
The first one, obviously, traditionally the parentage test, uh, testing was conducted by blood typing, so looking at the different blood types of the animals and trying to match up um, calves and, and parents. Since the, the mid-1980s, that's kind of been started to be replaced with this DNA-based parentage verification. So the kind of major reasons where, or benefits that I see of the DNA technology as to where it could be used within your operation. The first one is obviously to reduce those pedigree areas, to, to get more accurate pedigree. Um, what that will then assist us with is that obviously our selection decisions will be more accurate and our rate of genetic progress will be increased than what it currently is. There are also some practical things which it allows us or some benefits. First one is obviously we're still mothering up calves. If we can use DNA parentage verification, then we, we have some labour savings and some, and some hassles um, that, aren't any, that we can get around. Um, obviously people want to use multiple sire matings at the moment. It's impossible to do that or very difficult to do that, so we rely on single sire joinings. Um, if there are people now using DNA-based parentage verification, joining multiple sires and then using the, the DNA to identify the individual sire for their breed society purposes and their breeding purposes. A few other novel ways that people are starting to use it also is just for animal identification. In some cases where um, animals have lost tags and those things, they can collect DNA and actually trace that back to who the animal is. So based on, on the DNA uh, parentage verification which is available, most of the breed societies now are starting to implement a few regulations in, regation, in relation to this DNA parentage verification to actually maintain some integrity or some quality checks on the pedigree information which has been recorded with their breed societies. Um, I'll just put up an example there of the different regulations. Every breed society has its own kind of version of regulations and we range right from the top there with uh, the Wagyu Association uh, requiring all calves to be fully DNA parent verified uh, before they can be registered. And then we go right down there to in terms of the, the degree of regulations down to, I guess, the, the Santa Gertrudis and the Belmonts at the bottom, which at the moment will just request DNA information on animals in question. So uh, they've got no specific regulations. Now, the rest of the breeds kind of fit in between. Just to explain some terminology there, um, when we're saying there, there are two kind of steps, I guess, to the, the DNA parent verification process. The first one is actually getting a... a um, a fingerprint on the animal, if you like, or going in and actually getting the, the DNA type. And then the second step would be to actually verify whether, based on that DNA information which we fingerprinted, that the sire and the dam are correct. So um, in this case, I guess we look at limousine. The first thing is that before any calf can be registered, the sire needs to have DNA information recorded, so it needs a DNA fingerprint. Likewise, for embryo calves, uh, we require the donor dams need a DNA fingerprint. And then they go through the limbs and society and will actually randomly sire verify every 500th natural calf which is recorded. And I think every AI and ET calf um, next to that. So they're, they're doing some random verification as well as collecting DNA information. Um, Angus, Red Angus, Simital and Simbra. They are, you have, have the same requirements there for actually collection of DNA information, but rather than going through and doing every 500th calf, they're just looking and for the DNA uh, samples which are collected, the, the DNA fingerprints which are collected, they go through and either sire or fully parent verify each of those just to check as a routine, oper um, so some routine sire verification. Um, others uh, coming down, the other breeds there, just need some DNA information that they collect and they're not actually doing any routine verification of that. So that's just an idea of some of the different regulations as to where we're going and how some of the breed societies are using the DNA uh, to maintain some integrity in their, their uh, databases. So some take home messages now, we'll just break for some questions. Um, the first one, obviously, is pedigree is quite an important piece of information and quite powerful for us, and particularly in the seed stock industry. But it's important to realise that our current pedigree information is not perfect. Um, it's certainly the degree of error um, I've suggested is around 5%, but I have only got, haven't really got much basis for saying that other than a few indications. But um, we'd like to think it's, it's not a major issue, but obviously we do need to acknowledge that um, they're not 100% accurate. 
and this is where the DNA-based parentage verification fits in to provide us with a tool um, to actually reduce those pedigree errors while offering some, some management benefits and many of the breed societies have now implemented these regulations based on the, on the DNA parentage verification. So we might break now um, just for some questions um, and as we said we've um, got Emily Piper on the line to, to answer any of those so if you'd like to, to send those in uh, we'll just have a look at, at what we have here. Um, <coughs> so we've got a couple that have come in. Um, so quite a few of them just relate to the, the logistics of, of DNA collection which uh, we might hold over uh, to, for, to, to the next couple of sessions but So there is uh, one question here saying uh, normally in this situation uh, would cattle get registered without parentage verification? Um, so certainly as per those regulations that uh, I put up there then there are, th 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 not all animals do need to get re fully parent verified. Uh, it depends on the breed. Um, how accurate is the DNA testing? Obviously I think we'll, we'll hold that over um, for the next session as well. And most of the other questions, sorry, just to read through these as we're going, um, we will, so there's one question here, Emily, which I'll pass to you. Um, is there any need to DNA verify animals in a crossbreeding operation? Oh, um, I, would, I would say that depends on what your breeding objectives are. Um, yeah, gosh, I don't know what I can say about that, Andrew. Uh, it's really up to what you want out of um, your breeding operation. If you want to prove that, um, if you want to prove that particular bulls are working, um, and you want to know how many calves they've got on the ground, then then for sure. Uh, but if it's a terminal operation, all the cat cattle are going to slaughter, then um, I'm, I'm not sure. That'd be up to you. Yeah, that's it's. Um, what I'll be thinking, um, in terms of just I'd ask that question just probably a different way. Um, is there any issues with DNA parentage verification working differently in a um, crossbreeding operation? So will it will it still work exactly oh. the same as it would in a straight breeding operation? Oh yes, 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 absolutely fine. Okay, thank you. Um, as I said, there are quite a few questions there, but most of them relate to things that we're going to cover. So I will. Um, keep going. And we'll start to get in now and actually start to discuss the parentage verification in a bit more detail. So the first thing um, that, that I'd like to go through now is actually start to look at well how does the DNA parentage verification work and, and a lot of the questions which you raise there uh, do relate exactly to that. Um, to answer that question, I think we really need to go in and start to have a look at the structure of DNA. So we, we covered this last week, but I just want to quickly refresh it uh, because it, it really allows us to answer uh, how DNA parentage verification works um, in a bit more detail. So if you remember the, the structure of DNA, uh, we said last week that DNA is made up of these two strings of nucleotides. So if you can see my mouse coming down the screen there, We've got one string here on one side and another string on the other side and they, they bind together to form this unique double helix um, kind of formation. Um, they're made up, those two strings of nucleotides are made up of three different components. So we've got a phosphate group and a, a sugar molecule and they basically form the backbone of this string of the nucleotide. The thing which is really important to us are the third component which are the nitrogenous bases which bind the two strings together. And those nitrogenous bases, there's four different types of those. There's an adenine, thymine, guanine and cytosine, or as they commonly are always abbreviated to, A, T, G and C. 
and the way the chemical structure of those works um, is basically the A and the T always bind together and the G and the C always bind together. So um, those nitrogenous bases form the, form the middle and across the animal's actual genome there are around 3 billion different nucleotides. So the important thing is that those nucleotides, the sequence of them differs between animals. So what we're saying to look at with all this DNA technology is we're going in, we're looking at the sequence of the nitrogenous bases, so the A's, T's, G's and C's, differs between animals and using that for different purposes. How the, and this allows us to actually understand how the parentage verification works. Traditionally, the parentage verification has worked off these forms of gene markers called microsatellites. So if we have a look um, at the example on the screen here, a microsatellite is where in that nitrogenous base pair sequence for a particular animal, we have a repeat of a particular sequence. So in the example below, we have a CA, a CG and an AT, and that is repeated over and over. And in one particular animal, we might say that that's repeated 58 times, in another animal it's repeated 50 times. So we can go in, we can measure that, and start to relate calves back to potential size, etc. So that's the, the traditional basis for how it's worked. In practice, we're not just looking at one particular microsatellite, so we're looking at multiple microsatellites, um, and the actual number that which is used is varies significantly between the different genotyping labs. So um, in this case, we've got the, the two major providers in Australia, the University of Queensland, the Animal Genetics Lab there, and uh, Pfizer. So the University of Queensland, they use 12 core microsatellites um, as part of their testing and they're actually, the 12 core ones are they're known as the standard kind of ISAG uh, markers. So the International Society of, of Animal Genetics have these 12 recommended microsatellite markers. Both the University of Queensland and, and Pfizer use those plus each of the different labs have some additional markers of their own which they use. So in the case of uh, University of Queensland, they have another 10 which they put into their standard microsatellite uh, parentage verification test, so they're using 22. In the case of Pfizer, uh, they have seven others, so they're using 19. University of Queensland also have a, another 12 which they use to try and resolve some difficult or, or disputed cases. The actual mechanism by how this microsatellite testing works is really based on, I guess, not so much confirmation that that, that sire or that parent, that animal is a parent of the animal, but excluding, if we go through the list of potential sires, excluding those which aren't the sire to come back with one, therefore, that we assume to be the sire. So we, we need to consider parentage verification in that light. Um, now, we're saying there the accuracy of excluding the incorrect parents, um, in this case I think we're using the University of Queensland information, is around 99% if we know or have DNA from all parents, of all potential parents, um, in the case of where we've only got the one potential, uh, so say size, we've only got DNA on those, then we expect the difference or the accuracy there to be between 98 to, to 99 type of percent. To explain what I mean by exclusion, we'll just bring up an example of, say, one particular microsatellite. And as I, I stressed before, uh, we're using around, I guess, around 20 as an example. So if we start just to explain this, this is just an image of the microsatellites once the length of the repeat, um, the repeat in that nitrogenous base pair sequence has actually just been digitized. So uh, if we look at the, the calf here in, in the middle, um, at this case, it's, as we also said last week, uh, when we look at an animal's DNA, they get two copies of the DNA. So they get one copy from the sire, one copy from the dam. So in this case, we're looking at, at the calf. Um, in the two copies that it's got in terms of the size, uh, we just put some numbers around those. The actual explanation of what the numbers are doesn't matter too much, but we can see the calf there. The, the two copies which he's got, he's got a 262, and a 266 when we look at this particular microsatellite. So if we look down at the dam's DNA below, we can see that that dam had, uh, for that particular microsatellite, 266 and 270. So we therefore know that she passes on you know, one copy to the calf. So the calf has inherited that 266 
from the dam. So we then go and start to look at the potential size to see, well, which one of those has a 262, because that's where obviously the, the 262 has come from the size side. We had two potential size in this case, so one of them had a, a 256 and a 262, the other one had 258 and a 260, so therefore we can go through and exclude sire 2 as a potential um, potential sire of this calf because the, the two, I guess, forms of the, the gene or the DNA that that calf has, the sire, um, sire 2 doesn't possess. We can't actually confirm that sire 1 is the case. Um, we think he is because we're saying there are only two potential sires, but if another bull that we didn't know about had got in inside that calf and by chance he had a 262, then it's possible that he was actually the sire of the calf. So we're working here on actually excluding the incorrect size rather than and, and using that by default to confirm who the parents of the animal are. The other way um, that we, or the other method of using it apart from microsatellites, microsatellites are the, the traditional way that this has been done. Some labs are now starting to look at SNP based parentage verification. So just to explain what we're talking about with SNPs, um, we're talking about single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, and this is where we're not looking at a, a sequence for a particular animal, a, a sequence of repeats, but more just one particular nitrogenous base pair. So we look at an animal's DNA at one particular uh, spot, and look at what that base pair is, and you see the animal at the top there has a, a C and a G, the animal down below has a T and an A. So um, this is really the basis for our current production traits, but some of the labs, as I said, are starting now to use these for our DNA based parentage verification. So Pfizer in particular are now offering a 96 SNP based test for parentage verification in the US, and that's currently being adopted by American Angus, and primarily uh, because it's, it's combining it with their production trait test, the, the Angus 50K test. University of Queensland are starting to look at it and plan to offer um, some SNP based parentage tests. Why the, the difference between the microsatellite and the SNPs, um, it's probably better to, to leave that to Emily to comment. Um, but obviously the, the major benefit that I can see is to reduce the cost of parentage verification. So if we can combine our parentage verification in a SNP based test for say genetic conditions and our production traits, all part of the one test, the one, there are some economies there and therefore we can start to do some parentage verification at a more cost effective um, level. There's also I guess some, some argument about which one's more accurate and as I said I'll, I'll leave Emily to, to probably make some comments on that. So it's probably a good time there just having explained that uh, just to address some questions. Um, so I'll, I'll have a look through those and I'd, I'd invite you to, to send in some, some questions now if, if you do have them. Um, the first one I'll, I'll just say Emily um, for you is if you'd like to make any comment on the difference between the SNP based versus the microsatellite uh, based testing and what the relative advantages and disadvantages are. Okay, so with, as, as Andrew mentioned, the SNP based parentage um, is advantageous if you're going to be doing uh, genomic testing for production traits. So when the beef CRC releases their prediction equations for carcass quality and, and fertility and whatnot, which are based on a SNP platform, then you're already paying to have the genotype for those production traits and we can use the same genotype to do parentage as well. So you're basically getting the parentage for nothing or for a minuscule amount as compared to what you're paying for the production traits. Um, if you're not interested in the production traits or don't want to pay $100 or $150 or whatever it's going to be for the production traits, then you're probably best sticking with the microsatellite panel for parentage if that's all you're interested in because that's ultimately going to be cheaper than just doing a SNP panel for parentage. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, Emily, which has come in is what makes a microsatellite um, an ISAG marker and what role does the ISAG play in animal genetics or in the, the um, parentage verification? 
Uh, okay, so the International Society for Animal Genetics um, set up uh, a bunch of committees for uh, each of the different species, which was basically to standardize the reporting of microsatellite markers between laboratories, because as you saw on that graphical output that Andrew put up, uh, we label our alleles, the 262 and the 266, based on the size of the fragment that we see in our laboratory, but because different labs design their assays different ways and the nomenclature is basically uh, irrelevant. People just name their markers in different ways. ISAG was set up to standardize that reporting process between the laboratories. So we take part in the comparison test every two years. So there's a duty lab that sends out samples and we all have to report in the international standard to make sure we're all talking the same language. Okay, thank you. And that probably um, raises another question which I've got here, um, which relates to how accurate is parentage verification um, as a, I guess, and potentially, I guess we could address there some of the issues which might have uh, come up in some false positives, if you like, in the parentage verification that might have arisen. Okay, so... The accuracy of parentage verification is really based on a few different things. It's the number of markers that are analysed in your parentage panel. It's the variability, the genetic variability of those markers that you're using. So there's no point uh, using a parentage marker that we only ever see three or four alleles in a population. We want to be using markers that see 20 or 30 alleles in a population because I might have a 266-2670 and Andrew might have a 275-277, blah, 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 blah. And the more variations you get, the more useful that marker becomes for parentage verification. So basically the number of markers, the variability of those markers, and the variability of those markers does vary within breed. So. Um, breeds that have a smaller genetic base or slightly more closely related, then the accuracy of parentage verification is reduced uh, as opposed to some of the composite breeds which would have uh, better genetic variability. Um, as Andrew said, the uh, exclusion probability of a 22 mark panel with both parents is involved is above 99.99%. And when your exclusion probability is that high, um, it doesn't, well, it matters less whether you have typed and analysed all of the possible sires. So Andrew was talking about uh, ex, um, parentage verification being an exclusion process. When your exclusion probability is low, then it means you really do have to find all of the sires that could possibly be the sire and genotype them and exclude them. But if your, parentage prob uh, if your exclusion probability is high, like above 99.99%, then it's less important to exclude all of the possible sires because there's less probability that any one of them is going to qualify anyway. But it's always based on a pro uh, 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 process of exclusion, and we never say that a certain sire is definitely, definitely, definitely the sire of a particular offspring. Okay, Emily, one, that probably uh, leads into, I guess, to an, another question which has been asked, and it's been asked in a, a couple of different forms here. So, um, basically, how does the accuracy relate there when we've got very related sires? So, um, basically, if I have um, a father and a son combination, will I still get definitive enough results? You should do. Uh, it really depends on the luck of the draw. I mean, we do 40,000 of these a year, and we very rarely see animals, even in close-knit kind of line breeding situations, that exclude in only one marker or so. Uh, so it really, it really depends on the luck of the draw. If, if that. Um, it's been some luck of the draw. Yeah. So I guess I an a, another similar question, which is probably the same answer, but are there any issues there with if we're line breeding or bulls that are full brothers or half brothers are used? So particularly, I guess, if, if people are looking at their multiple sire matings. Yeah. 
Not particularly. So if we ever have more than one sire qualifying to the calf, we can do two things. We can bump up the number of markers used to 33, which will generally, well, I've actually never seen two, two sires qualify over 33 markers to a particular calf. Uh, or if you don't want to do that, we can bring the dam into the equation. So um, having the dam there increases the stringency of the analysis and usually will knock one of the two sires out. Okay, the last question which we'll cover is, um, probably because I didn't explain it very well, so I'll let you explain it, is to what do the actual numbers mean on that uh, slide that I showed with the, the different alleles? Oh, sure. So the different alleles in microsatellites are basically caused by a difference in the number of the repeat motifs within the market. So that AC, 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 AC repeat. Uh, Andrew might have 12 AC repeats and I might have 14 AC repeats. So that little number under it is just really a reflection of the number of repeat motives in the marker and of course the number of repeat mo uh, motives uh, changes the size of the marker. So we just call them by the number of repeat motives contained in the marker. Okay, thank you very much, Emily, um, and some really great questions there. So we'll move on with the presentation. We've, we've just got the, the last part of the, the presentation now to cover, which deals more with um, the logistics of actually testing. So we've had a few questions that have come in, both in the, the first question session and, and that one to, that relate to this, so hopefully we answer those now. Um, so as we said, to, to actually get your animals tested, what are the kind of logistics or the options um, which are available to you. The two main labs that I'm aware of that, that do the testing in Australia um, is the Animal Genetics Lab at the University of Queensland, who obviously Emily is um, giving us her time tonight, and also Pfizer Animal Genetics in Brisbane. So uh, they're the two main labs. Um, you can go direct to those labs, but the important thing I guess is for, for all of you, I think are members of different breed societies, and really the breed societies all have different contracts um, with either one of the labs or both of the labs. Um, and so it's an important thing when you start looking at your, uh, actually doing some parentage verification if you're interested in it, first of all to ask your breed society whether there is a particular lab that you need to deal with um, and whether they have a contract with them. If the breed society doesn't have a contract with um, one of the, the, these labs, then I would really be suggesting that you put some pressure on them to do it. The main benefit is um, obviously that the, the breed society deals that they have uh, offer the test at a subsidised rate. So then start looking at that. They're the two labs that you can get the testing done through. Um, the cost of actually testing is a very hard question to answer because it depends on a number of different factors. Um, it really depends on things like what's the type of DNA sample you're collecting. The most standard way that we're doing it at the moment um, is through hair samples. Um, but obviously DNA can be, well, the parentage verification deck can be done through any form of DNA we can collect. So through blood, through tissue, um, and, and the other f forms that, that we can collect. So uh, that actually, to answer one of the, the different questions um, that, that we had right at the start was how can we do it on dead animals? So um, in this case, I think a, a tissue sample um, that has been suggested to me, just taking a slice of the ear, putting that in a bag, sending that off, maybe a, a way of doing the parentage verification if you're interested on, on that on a dead animal. Um, other things which really affect uh, the, the cost there is the number of samples. So the more samples you do it tends to be the cheaper the rate um, and also what you're requesting. So whether you're requesting just a, a DNA fingerprint, so you just want, want the DNA type information to store that on the breed society database or whether you actually want parentage verification carried out as well. So as an indicative cost, and it's a very wide range, I know, um, we'll say the parentage verification at the moment is anywhere between that $20 to $50 per sample. Um, through the breed societies, it tends to be more down towards the, the $20, $30. If you're doing it direct with the lab, then it tends to be more up around the $45, $50. Um, gross generalisations, if you're interested in it, obviously the, the people to contact as a first point of call is your breed society. 
Uh, there is also information, I should say, if you're going to deal with the labs directly on each of the different websites um, for both Pfizer and the University of Queensland. Logistics of actually recording, uh, the first thing you need to do is to actually get a um, kind of DNA collection kit. Now, in most of the situations, you'll contact your breed society for those. So, again, it comes down to if you're looking at doing this, contact your breed society for instructions. Um, generally, in most cases, they'll be able to send you out a, um, a DNA collection kit, which at the moment, as I said, most of us are working off uh, hair samples. You then take that DNA sample, so in most cases it's a matter of just getting some, or taking or pulling 20 to 30 uh, hairs from the, from the brush of the tail. The important thing is there, we're after, actually after that, the hair bulb, so not just taking the hair, we need to, to pull it out and actually get um, the, the uh, root of the bulb. Um, then it's just a matter of doing the paperwork, putting it in an envelope and sending it off uh, to the lab so when, and waiting for the results to be returned. So that's the kind of process. Um, obviously talking to your breed society, talking to the uh, DNA lab, you'll be able to get some more specific information there as to exactly what they require, but that's the, the general steps involved. Um, just some, some considerations when testing, that, and this is just coming from, from my perspective again. I think that the big issue that we've got when we look at parentage verification at the moment that you need to weigh up is the cost of the testing versus the benefit that you will receive. So, and there's no simple answer to that. It, it really depends on your individual situation. We talked at the very start about some of the benefits. So, benefits relating to the, the ac increased accuracy of your pedigree information, but probably more so um, the actual management benefits that it can. If you wanted to look at some multiple sire matings or removing the need to, to mother up calves, then there's obviously a benefit there. Weighing that up versus the, the cost there of, uh, say, 20 to $30 an animal. Um, so that, which is, is quite a significant cost. So that, that's the, um, I guess, the, the first consideration when you're looking at this, and probably cost is the thing that is impeding this at the moment, other than the routine kind of just breed society checking and the breed society regulations. We are hopeful, um, not so much the cost of parent verification as a standalone test is going to come down, but more so, as, as we talked about, if we can include parent verification in um, association with a combined test for, for some of our other things, then we may be able to get it down to a level where that cost has decreased and, and the benefits might start to improve. I guess some novel ways that you can consider using it is rather than testing all animals, say if you have your, your size and you just want to verify that the, the size you're using, uh, you may need to do that for breed study regulations anyway, but if you've got um, some potential size that you're looking at, say, um, just doing some parentage verification on those to check their pedigrees if you want to use it for the benefit of, of making sure your selection decisions are accurate. Uh, we talked about um, some of the, the errors or how accurate DNA parentage verification is. I'll also just make note there that we have had some situations where people have done some testing for their breed society purposes and animals have come back as failing the parentage or the, the potential sire is, is not the, the sire and people have been quite adamant that it's the only possible sire or the only possible dam and when they've gone back and actually looked at it we do have some errors in some of the DNA fingerprint information which is being stored so just an important thing to note there um, and it's particularly evident when we're starting to work across between different laboratories, uh, where in some cases um, you know, we've got some animals that have been typed with the University of Queensland, some with, with Pfizer, and we have had some discrepancies there. So um, it's just an important consideration when you're doing your testing um, to note that if you do get a false positive, then starting to investigate it um, might be a, a first point of call, um, again, knowing that the DNA is not 100% accurate. Um, the, the third one, um, just to consider when you're looking at your testing when you're using blood samples, is the presence of these things called chimeras. Um, what we're talking about there is a, a complication in DNA is when we're looking at twin calves, um, we do get situations where the twin calf appears to be carrying actually a copy of the DNA of its, its sibling, um, and that can cause some errors when we start looking at the DNA testing. So uh, if anyone's got any questions, Emily might be able to comment more on that, but it is a, another uh, potential situation where we can get some errors sleeping into it. 
Uh, and the last one we've already talked about, but I think the real future with this parentage verification um, in, in really uh, improving that cost benefit situation is to combine the parentage verification with our other DNA based tests. So that really brings me to the, the end of my standard presentation tonight. Um, we will break now. There's a few more questions that have come in. So before I, I pass back to Philip at the end, just to, to wind up the webinar tonight, um, we'll break now for another set of questions. So um, I'd invite you to, to send those in. Um, and we'll have a look at those. So first question, Emily. Um, is do the results of parentage verification stay stored for future reference? Um, so for example, a future calf could be compared or do you need fresh air from all parties each time? Oh no, yeah, so we store all of the original biological samples that come into the lab. We store all of the DNA types on our database and we store all of the parents with which the calf has been tested against on our database with the qualification and the exclusion. So no, if, if you have a fresh batch of calves come in, we don't need to see the parents again. We d you just need to list the case numbers that um, are relevant to the parents and we'll pull them out of the database and do the analysis. Okay, thank you. Um, does the age of the hair matter? Uh, can we pluck and store it at any time we want to test it down the track? Generally hair keeps very well. We routinely test off samples that have been stored for 10 to 15 years in our lab. Um, it depends a little bit on the nature of the test that you want to do. Um, a test that we're doing for the Angus Society at the moment um, is a particularly tricky one and the integrity of the DNA is very important in that test. So uh, depending on how you store it, you might not want to be doing a 50k SNP tests with a hair sample that's been stored for 15 years, but as I said, uh, that can often depend on how it was originally co collected and how it's been stored. When you collect your hair samples, they have to be clean and dry, and they certainly have to be dry before they go into a plastic bag, because if they're not, then mould grows on them, and that's what kills your DNA. But uh, if they're collected... If they're collected a little bit damp, they can go into a paper envelope to dry out and then go into a snap lock plastic bag. Okay, a couple of questions along those lines. Can you store hair samples? I'm oh, sorry, how's the best way to store hair samples just for future testing? Um, should they be placed in the freezer or I get um, yeah, I guess people there just looking at collecting DNA, not necessarily testing now, but storing it on farm. Yeah, just in a paper envelope in your filing cabinet. So at room temperature in a nice room temperature dark spot in your office, uh, in a paper envelope will be fine. But again, it really depends. Make sure there's no manure or, or anything on it when you collect it. Um, next question. If we collect and test DNA now, how long will University of Queensland store that DNA? And um, particularly looking at for it to be available to maybe test again when more advanced DNA technologies are discovered. Yeah, so as I said before, we've never actually thrown out any biological sample that's come into our lab since 1994. Um, and we keep that specifically because we keep increasing our marker panel. There are always new recessive tests uh, that are becoming issues within breeds and we therefore have the samples archived to go back through the pedigree and help out with that kind of testing and they will certainly be available for future SNP panel testing in the future. Um, but again, it just comes back to whether that sample was collected appropriately in the first place, how much is available after doing the parentage testing or any other kind of recessive or selective trait testing in the process. But um, yeah, bottom line is, yes, we keep everything. Okay, um, thank you. The next one is, uh, why is the... Um, hair bulb or follicle required rather than just a piece of hair? So where we actually extract the DNA from the hair bulb, uh, there's no DNA in hair, it's just dead cells and we're after that kind of fleshy little tissuey bit at the end of the hair to actually extract DNA out of, which um, is why if we collect a 
request a recollect if you've set, sent samples in. It's generally because we can't actually see any hair follicles on the hair. So by that, are you telling me that when I watch uh, all those crime shows on telly and they just find a, a little bit of hair that they can't actually use anything with that, they need the hair bulb? Yes, it's crap, Andrew. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you just wrecked all my illusions. They're putting us all in a bad light when we can't get a result for a piece of hair. <laughs> um, a few more just relating to um, storage. So can you wash and dry out a collected sample if it's been manure affected? Yes, just wash it and dry it out. That, that should be fine. Okay. Um, what's the ideal age for an animal to, to be when hair is collected? So um, I guess we'll, we'll start looking there. What's the kind of minimum age that can be done? Yeah, so we ideally ask for anything over kind of 8 to 12 weeks of age. It depends on the animal and how uh, that that tail is developing, but um, it's very hard to extract out of those little fluffy calf hairs, so we kind of asked, ask if people can um, put that off until at least 8 to 12 weeks of age. If you'd like to, I had a, um, a producer call last week saying that he wanted to collect DNA as he was tagging the calves at birth, and an option for that would be to collect a blood spot from when you're tagging, just um, collect a blood spot on filter paper. Uh, it's the same cost as hair to be processed, and we can provide you the filter papers for collection. Okay, thank you. I guess I'll just make a comment there as well that um, as DNA is kind of progressing, I think we're starting to see a few more novel ways of uh, collecting it as well. So. Um, Probably they're very much under development, but we now have a few different options there uh, for people taking nasal swabs, uh, blood cards as part of the tagging process, tissue as part of the tagging process, etc. So um, there's probably some that's very much under development, um, but there are some other things to be aware of that uh, the other ways of collecting DNA, which is starting to develop now. Um, we'll just have one or two more questions. Um, so the f one there is uh, relating to um, how do you do a DNA test of a sire that's deceased if you don't have DNA on him? Can you only eliminate other potential sires if they're, st I'm presuming they're still alive? Yeah, so we can, we can do what we call the DNA build. Uh, we do like to have DNA from any other potential sire on the property but we can build the sire in question. If he's got, uh, say, 10 to 20 calves on the ground, and you can supply the dam DNA of those calves as well, we can deduce the DNA profile for the dead sire. Okay. Uh, very last question, uh, which we'll just ask is, if they sent you a hair sample five years ago, um, this relates to the, the production trust. Can they get a, a 50k analysis done now in the case of the Angus breed? Uh, yes, it would depend whether it's been um, stored correctly, whether there's like, for, for a 50k SNP test you need a great deal more DNA than you would for just a standard parentage test, so it depends whether there's enough hair follicles left from whatever testing has been done. I would encourage anyone who um, who has the animal still available to collect a fresh sample, um, probably blood on filter paper or a blood tube, just because um, 50k SNP tests are not cheap and you don't want to uh, jeopardise your assay with poor DNA quality. So we would be more than happy to get it out of storage if you can't possibly get another biological sample for that animal. but to optimise the results that you're going to get out of a 50k test and if the animal is still available, I would suggest that you collect it again. Okay, well, thank you very much, Emily, for your input um, and thank you, everyone, for, for the questions. Um, I'll hand back over now to uh, Philip just to, to close off the webinar. Um, as this, I think this will be the last time that I speak, so I'd just like to thank everybody for, for joining in tonight. We have gone a little bit over time, uh, but I think we've, we've allocated a bit of time to questions. Um, and again, I'll just thank Emily for her input there. So, Philip, uh, hopefully you're online just now to finish up the webinar.